I had made a solemn promise that I would not be a bishop. So I never expected to be a bishop. I hoped that I could be with the priests and people of my diocese an encourager of us together discerning God's will. Hello and welcome to Heart Talk here on Shalom World TV. My name is Ennio Callahan, and I'm delighted to be with my very own bishop here in Rafo Diocese, Bishop Alan McGuckian. Excellency, you're very welcome to the show. Thank um, you, and it's a pleasure to be meeting you today. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thanks for taking time out of your, your busy schedule. So we appreciate it. Um, I suppose to begin with, just to start off with a little bit about yourself, um, who you are, um, and your family background. Good. I was born in County Antrim in a little village called Plough Mills. I grew up in a very loving, uh, happy family. Uh, a very religious family. Um, both my parents were very devout. We said the, uh, the rosary every day. That was a happy enough thing at that early stage. The troubles broke out later around the time I was leaving home. Uh, they were obviously a huge uh, thing that mm -hmm. happened in my teens. Yeah, but that's the kind of background I, I come from. Uh, when you mention your teens there, I'd love to hear a bit more about that because you know, teenage years are a difficult time. You know, you're you're growing, you're you're introduced to new people or situation, new ideas. Um, what were your teenage years like? And during that time, um, was there any interests or hobbies that you had, or any uh, talents or, or gifts? I don't have tales of a wild, crazy uh, <laughs> teenage years. Um, most of my time, I, I, I went to boarding school, which was really important. From 11 to 18, I was on a boarding school in County Antrim, a place called Garan Tower, St. Magnesis College, Garan Tower. My overall memory is that it was a wonderful time, and particularly in my last two years, I had lots of things going on. I, I loved football and hurling. I just scraped onto the senior football team. I wasn't that good, really. <laughs> uh, I was good enough at hurling. Hurling had been played a lot in our local area among the Catholics of North Antrim. There's a big hurling tradition. So I, uh, I made the senior hurling team. Uh, that meant a lot to me. But actually, more importantly, I think, uh, though it didn't seem important to a teenage boy, uh, I did other stuff. Uh, there was a great tradition of acting. Um, we did an Irish play in my last year. We produced a wonderful play called La Le Michel, the story, a story from the Civil War. But it's a very fine play. That's beautiful. Um, what was your, your faith formation like at home, coming from you know, a business and, and farming background? My father was a very successful businessman. Uh, like it was a, a major pig breeding industry, as well as he was the managing director of a shirt factor, shirt manufacturing business. But um, his faith was more important to him than his business, uh, and I knew that. So uh, yeah, prayer came natural to my father. Leading us in the rosary wasn't something that we did because we were meant to. It was something we did because daddy and mommy took it very seriously. Prayer was just a part of our lives. I was an altar boy from the age of six or seven and going to Mass regularly. Faith was just a part of our lives, one that was esteemed and, and valued. Like, as I said, Daddy had many skills and talents, but his faith was more important to him than any of them. Wonderful. Um, what made you choose the priestly life? Um, you know, considering that you had this business background, many different interests and hobbies, um, why the priesthood? I, I did, no, it's the whole world knows. So uh, two of my brothers were already, they were already, one of them was already a priest and the other was on his way to being a priest in the Jesuit order, the Society of Jesus. But that would have been a reason for me not to, you know. <laughs> uh, I, I know I, even when, 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 when I eventually told my mother I, I think she thought, have I not, you know, uh, have, have we not given, given enough? enough? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, um, no, when in my 
I think it was my second last year in school when you know, teachers started talking about thinking seriously about what you're going to do with your life. And obviously it was a Catholic school, it was a, a Catholic boarding school. The idea that God would have a plan for you was raised. And, and when it was, just I was thinking, just my mind began to think about priesthood. I thought, you know, what do I really value? What do I think is really, really important? Well, I believe it's really important that there be priests. Um, somebody should be a priest. And I remember sitting in English class, looking around, looking at so and so and so and so, and thinking he'd be very good and he'd be very good, and really not wanting it for me. Mm. Okay, uh, very much not wanting it for me. Mm. But it was a fixed idea that would not go away. I went to Queen's University in Belfast uh, to do an arts degree, stuff that I was really interested in and that I, well, that I thought I would enjoy. Um, and that the idea was that I would uh, find something else to do mm. other than being a priest. But the idea would not go away. And it's a long story and won't go, won't go into all the details. But I happened for certain reasons to be around the Jesuit house of Clongos, where one of my brothers, Michael, was at that time um, to boarding school and he had just finished his two years on the staff and I was there helping out with a summer course. Uh, well, it was actually, it was a summer school, or not a school for young boys getting out of Belfast in the summer of 1971 when there was very serious trouble in Belfast and these were young boys from troubled areas and they were given a break away. I was helping on that and just while I was there this idea would not leave me and I, Michael was the first one I spoke to. He heard me, he said, well listen, if you want to speak to somebody you could speak to uh, the, the provincial of the Jesuits who happens to be passing here uh, tomorrow. Uh, I met the provincial and uh, one thing led to another and uh, even though the plan was that I would not enter immediately, that I, I, I would finish the degree that I had started, I'd only done one year, yeah. um, I eventually said, no, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it now. And I was accepted into the novitiate that year. So uh, I was, back in those times, I was considered a late vocation. I was one year <laughs> out of school. Uh, and uh, then, um, I suppose that the real question is, why did I stay? Yeah. You know, I. I, I well, I, I just eventually I realized that in, in spite of this, in some ways, this reaction against, um, you know, I wanted a normal life. I wanted yeah. marriage and family and all these things. Uh, and, and those were really strong things working in me. I realized at the end of the novitiate, uh, by before the end of the two years, that deep down I was happy here and that mm -hmm. this deep down this is what I wanted. Mm -hmm. It was what, what God wanted but uh, in time I came around. Just a good contentment with it. Yes, yeah. okay. and, and realising that I choose this. Yeah. God has chosen me, but I choose Jesus. this. Yeah. It's wonderful. Um, I suppose coming from your, your business background, what kind of maybe skills, entrepreneurial skills, or what skills did you take from that leading into then you know, your, your vocation? Was there any, um, any skills or tips that you learned along the way? Well, it, it's, it's more in retrospect, but I've, I've just, uh, I, there were four boys and two girls in my family. Okay. Three of us became Jesuits. So one uh, took over a big part of the family business. As he used to tell colleagues, uh, he was in shirt manufacturing, uh, that because of this Catholic thing, he had managed to quadruple his inheritance. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and and uh, there were, there were there's some people, English people that he worked with thought that was very good. But he said to me a thing that if you want to be good in business or if you want to be a leader in anything, you have to recognize the skills and talents that other people have that you don't have mm. and not be threatened by the fact that other people are better at X or Y or Z than you are or that they're smarter than you. Not be threatened, but delight in it. Mm. Give them their head and support them and uh, I hope I've done that over the years and I, I, I think I think that is one thing that comes from the kind of background I, I grew up in. And when you got the call then to become a bishop what was your what was your reaction and what was your, your dream or your 
um, inspirations when becoming the first Jesuit bishop in Ireland. Yeah, I well, um, as there do be in these circumstances, one hears rumours yeah. going around. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I had heard rumours. Some people said these rumours are pretty strong rumours. Uh, they may have some basis. But that doesn't prepare you for uh, the phone call. I worked in an office in the, day, in the Diocese of Down and Connor in Belfast, the Living Church office, and uh, I went into the office one day late. Uh, I had been doing something else, and uh, Geraldine said to me, oh, by the way, uh, they were calling you from the Apostolic Nunciature. They want you to call them. <laughs> she had an idea. <laughs> Nobody in the Nunciature had ever called me before. Yeah. Uh, and so I went down and met the, uh, the it, was a, it, was, it wasn't the nuncio, he had already left the country before the, our current nuncio came in his place. And uh, so he had, we went into the chapel and we prayed together. Uh, still he hadn't told me why I was here, <laughs> but we were going in to pray for the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And then we came out and uh, he hadn't done this many times before, uh, this, this young Polish priest. So he took out a, a thing and he read from it and, you know, His Holiness Pope Francis has chosen you, Father Alan McGookie, uh, to be the Bishop of... And there was a, there was a kind of a pause for a minute. And, uh, and then he said, and I, I remember some people had said part of the rumor was, you know, you're an Irish speaker, they will be looking, uh, they're looking for a bishop for a fool, they'll want an Irish speaker, that's a possibility. And I think I was saying, okay, it's going to be a fool, it's going to be a fool. And, and I was happy at that thought. Uh, I have uh, long af associations and affections with County Donegal, and he said, of a fool. And, <laughs> and I, do you accept? And so I said, I do. And uh, so obviously it was a life-changing moment. Um, I, as a Jesuit, some years previously, I had taken my final vows. Mm. And part of the additional promises that you take at your final vows, which I had signed very solemnly, was that I would never seek nor accept honours in the church, including the episcopate. So I had... I had made a solemn promise, as, all, as uh, many Jesuits are asked to, that I would not mm. be a bishop. So I never expected to be a bishop, mm. uh, for obvious reasons. And uh, what was my hope? What was my dream? Um, it, I suppose it, it's very much in, in the terms of St. Ignatius, uh, our Jesuit founder of discernment. Uh, I, I, I hoped that I could be with the priests and people of my diocese an encourager of us together discerning God's will. Mm. Um, it is hugely important at this moment in the history of the world and of the church that we become more explicitly and deliberately people who, who listen out for God's will, yeah. discern God's will. That is my dream. Um, in, in my early, my first couple of years here, uh, I began uh, a process of, of listening first to the priests and then in small groups to the people around the diocese and had gathered some ideas from what I had heard towards a pastoral plan. And then COVID hit and nobody could meet anybody. Uh, nobody could get out of the house for, you know, effectively nearly two years. Yeah. So in many ways, things were put on ice. But at the same time, I had a little group of people from my Council of Priests, joined by some lay people, working on a plan based on some of the pointers that we had heard. And uh, uh, my hope is uh, we will launch our plan during Lent. Mm. And a key element of it is that in parish communities, people will gather, particularly as parish pastoral councils, with the priest, and their function is not like a political function, or a, it, they're not even specifically decision-making groups. They are discerning groups. They will be. And I, I, I'm hoping that, that we will form one another in, in being people who will listen to what God is doing and saying, so that the, the future will be, the future will look and feel somewhat different. Yeah. 
the church will always be the church, but obviously we are moving into a future that's going to be different. And my dream is that we will discern God's will together as we go into that. Pope Francis is talking to us about synodality, and it's, that's really what I want, is to be the bishop of a synodal church in our diocese. I know anyway of people of, of Donegal, we're, we're delighted to have you, so <laughs> we're delighted you got to um, Rafo Diocese. Um, now that you are a bishop, and I'm, I'm sure you know your schedules are very busy, um, and what kind of, I suppose, things that you do that maybe brings you kind of peace or contentment or, or joy in, in your daily life, um, and also you know being able to do all your duties, but aside from that, something that, that, that brings you a lot of enjoyment. There are two things that go together that, that have me grounded, and they are prayer mm. and exercise. So you know, like prayer is not to be taken for granted, but when I pray well and, and give good time to prayer, I, I know there's a very good chance of me staying grounded, yeah. but also getting out and exercising. When I came to Letterkenny, one of the first things I did was Google Park Run Letterkenny, <laughs> and there was one. Yeah. So yeah. the Saturday after my I was I was ordained on the sixth of August, two thousand and seventeen, the feast of the uh, Transfiguration. The following Saturday, I showed up at the Park Run, and I've been running ever since. Mm, cool. And there's a wee group of people that, uh, when I'm free, I run with uh, two nights a week. Oh, lovely. And that made a big difference to my fitness levels and my readiness to get out and exercise. Then along the same lines, um, I discovered the Camino years ago and often went off for 10 or 12 days walking the Camino. And uh, here in Donegal, with the uh, centenary of the birth of St. Columkill, Columba, uh, which was there just in, in December, a few of us decided that we would see about establishing a Camino, linking all of the places uh, in Donegal, or as many as possible of the places associated with Colin Kill. So uh, twice uh, on two summers, I have walked from Glen Colum Kill, around the west coast, yeah. uh, out to Torrey, around to Garton, into Letterkenny, through Rufo and into Derry, wow. and indeed even up to Shrew in Inishowen, 250k. So it's, it's a, a brilliant first stage of a Camino. It's called Shi Holm Killa. And we're going to work and please God in coming years make that a real reality because Colin Kill is so important and he's all over Donegal. And the idea would be that we will walk on from Derry across the north coast, probably to Ballycastle, from where people could get a boat across to Argyle okay. and from Argyle up to Iona. Wow. That's the plan, um, and uh, in time to come, I certainly will. I will walk, please God, uh, on from where we have reached already and eventually reach Iona. Oh, that would be incredible. Yeah, wow. it will. It'll be great, great. And, and we'll do it. So tell us about your life as a Jesuit. Okay, I joined the Jesuits in 1972, and uh, I did a lot of study, as Jesuits do, in various places, including Canada and one section of my studies in India. I was involved in education for some years. Uh, before my ordination, I was ordained a priest uh, on the 22nd of June 1984. And then the next stage of my life was very much in communications. They wanted a communication wing of the Jesuits and myself and another priest and some lay people uh, did a lot of work in communications. So communications was, an, was a very important part of my life. And then the Irish language, I, I, was, a, I was a chaplain to Irish language schools, I edited a, an Irish language magazine, always very important to me. And the, the work that I did in the Diocese of Down and Connor on pastoral renewal was really, uh, it was a wonderful gift. Uh, and then uh, the change when I was called to be a bishop. Yeah, I just want to thank you so much um, to be able to speak to you and, and to, to hear about your background and your life and, and what you're doing now in, in and in the parish. It's, it's very exciting and both for young people it's very, it uh, gives a great sense of hope um, that's what you're doing. So thank you. Um, thank you for being with us on the show. And thank you for coming and for all your support. It's great. Thank you. And thank you for everyone who joined in to watch Shalom World TV. See you again.
searching for fulfillment? <laughs> Discover true happiness. Stay tuned to Shalom World.